Hi, and welcome to Tea Leaves Programming. Today we are programming like it's 1979, continuing our Haskell for Dilettantes series. So our next lab class is going to be doing homework two from Joachim Breitner's CIS 194 class from the University of Pennsylvania, fall 2016 edition. Um, in order to do that, you should read the lecture notes for class two. And I'm not going to follow those slavishly because they go in a kind of circuitous direction that I don't want, I don't think makes for a compelling video. Instead, we're going to look at our code, which we left off at the end of our lab for exercise three. And we're going to ask ourselves, how can we improve it? So there are really a few aspects of this code that we need to revisit. Uh, first, we have a lot of magic numbers in this code. We're using a lot of, oops, we're using a lot of integers just kind of thrown all around the place, for example, to represent what a tile is. So we can use algebraic data types, in this case, a sum type, to clean those up. Second, we're also using integers just to throw around these coordinates in kind of a willy-nilly fashion. And we might want to ask ourselves, is there something we can do to make that a little more systematic, to represent a coordinate? Lastly, in the last video, I defined draw columns very differently than Breitner did, in that I used a product type, a tuple of two integers to represent the coordinate. Why not? Seems sensible, right? And I think I said at the time that that was going to prove problematic. Spoiler, the reason is it makes partial application more difficult, and we'll see why. All right, well, the easiest thing to do here, the easiest way to start, is to take care of this code smell of having the maze represented by just raw integers. So let's go over here. You can see we have these various functions here. And we're going from an integer to a picture. So we're going to define a new data type. It's going to be a sum type, and we're going to call it tile. And tile is going to have the possible values, the possible valid values that could be here. So we're going to have a wall, could be a ground. There's a little buglet in code world where sometimes after a you type, you, it eats a space, and it, it keeps hitting me. Uh, storage in a box. I don't think we need to compare these uh, in any way or even print them. So we don't, I'm not going to put a deriving on here right now. And then we're going to change draw tile to go from a tile to a picture rather than from an integer to a picture. And we're just going to go ahead and do this. Now, do we need a blank? I think we do. I think we actually need a blank value to inhabit this type as well. Uh, and that will have a side effect, which is that we now know we don't need this wild card anymore. We're only going to draw a blank if what we get back is a blank. So previously, we needed that wild card. And this is trying to explain why one would use a sum type here, why one would use an enumeration. Previously, we needed that wild card because draw tile was taking an int, and this could potentially be any value. That would be valid input from, uh, from the domain of integers. But now we have this sum type, we're never going to see any values here other than these five values that we've defined. All right, so now that we've redefined draw tile to go from tile to picture rather than integer to picture, obviously our functions are no longer going to work and we're going to need to update those as well. So we see there's this error here and we can see that we're getting an integer where we expected a tile. And that's because we're calling draw tile from this helper function that I defined draw tile at. And it's getting that integer from right there, maze x, y. So we're going to go down here to where we defined our maze. And you can see there's all these magic numbers here. We want to take two integers and go to a tile. And then our tiles here are going to be exactly the same as they were before. So if it's out of bounds, it's a blank. Otherwise, it's going to be a wall if it's on the border. 
think that's what that says. And you can see just without the ability, without the semantics of the sum type, it's actually rather hard to know what this code even does. I think anything is not there is going to be a ground. That's our target area. And this is where our boxes are. Let's see if that works. It sure did. All right, now let's try to dig myself out of the hole that I dug myself into by using this tuple here. So let's go ahead and define a new version of this function. I'll call it draw calls. And that's going to have this data type, which is a much more Haskell style data type than what I uh, actually ended up using. So how would we, how would our function change? So for initially, let's just make it act exactly the same. Well, it would have these two arguments and it would have these two arguments and then this would all be the same. Right, I think that's correct. All of our errors went away, that's nice. So now let's modify our usage so that we are using the new one rather than the old one. And that's very simple. This is actually a very mechanical change so far. Oh, we actually need parentheses around the negative number. Oh, and I have to use the new. Right, I expect this to behave exactly the same as it did before, and it does, good. Oh, and I also need to change this usage here. Great. I also used X and Y for draw row and draw column. That's kind of weird. Let's change those to use R and C for row and column. So the thing that should start uh, jumping out at you now, and I'm gonna remove this old version of draw columns now, is how similar these two functions are. Now I said that I wasn't going to abstract prematurely, but we're past the point of wanting to abstract this. Having this code be very different is somewhat confusing. So why did I need to change this to a uh, to taking two integers, essentially, instead of taking a tuple? Well, if we look at this, the conceptual thing that should jump out of you, jump out at you here, is that for any given call to draw calls, this R value, the row value, is never ever varying. Only the column value is varying. So that's one problem with this function right now. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch the order of those arguments for reasons that'll become clear shortly. I'm just gonna do that magically offline. All right, so the interesting thing here that you need to remember is that function application is right associative. So this type is the same as that type. In other words, draw calls is a function that takes an integer and then returns a function that takes an integer and returns a picture. And if we look at these two functions now, they are so similar that we should be able to abstract them out. How would we do that? Well, we want to draw something. And in both of these cases, this differs. And this is always a recursive call to ourselves, right? How can we sketch that out? And so what we're doing here is we're writing a function that takes a function as an argument and returns a picture. And if you look, that function itself is using a helper function inside a where clause that essentially is doing the exact same heavy lifting we're doing in draw rows and draw calls, this recursive call. And we noted that that recursive call really only changed in terms of what's happening in this clause. In one place, in one case, we're calling down into this very similar function. And then at the bottom level, we're calling draw tile at. Well, having abstracted this out, we can get rid of both of these now. And the syntax you're seeing here is what we call lambda syntax. So instead of giving these functions names, 
we're going to use them once and throw it away. And this works exactly the same as that code did before, just with a lot fewer bindings. Um, I actually find this style of programming, the heavy use of lambdas, pretty easy to get lost in. So if you find yourself getting lost, don't be afraid to pull things out and give them names if they help you as a programmer. But since Professor Breitner uses this method going forward in the starting point for exercise two, we're going to use it too. I believe he called draw helper draw 21 times or something. And we could further abstract this. Draw helper itself starts at negative 10 and marches forward until this value is 11. We could pull that out and make this type take another integer and then um, uh, abstract that part out as well. I'm not going to do that here. I'm going to stop the layers of abstraction right here. So what else do we need to do to get ready for exercise uh, for homework number two? Homework number two is going to involve making the avatar, the player in our Sokoban game, move around the map. So we need some data types to help with that. Um, we need a facing because we want the animation of the person to change depending on which uh, direction they're facing. And we need to keep track of where they are in the map. And we are throwing around a lot of row and column coordinates here. So having a data type for that makes sense. So let's do that one first. And we're going to give it a data constructor. Professor Breitner uses the data constructor C, so I'm going to use that as well. And then we'll just say X and Y coordinates as part of that. Except I forgot that in some types we need constructors. So those are just going to be integers. And then we need a direction. And for that, we'll just say up, down, left, and right. And if we need to derive shower EQ, we'll do that when we need to. Now, I think this might be the first time in this class that we've seen this syntax where there's some string and then values after it in a constructor. So let's write a helper function that we're going to need for the upcoming episode uh, to determine the adjacent coordinate. So given some coordinate and a direction, return a coordinate. And you know, I think we actually want to reverse the order of those because the direction is the thing we're going to get from whatever we're using for input, right? So there should be four cases here because there are four directions, right? So we've got up and then some coordinate. I'm going to use my undefined here to keep track of where we are. Two, three, four. I said up, down, left, and right. Yeah. All right, so if we have some coordinate, how do we how do we get these coordinates out of this data type? Well, say it with me, we use pattern matching. So what does that look like? Well, our constructor here is C, so we're going to use C, X, and Y. Um, a Haskellism that you see a lot in these data types is someone will make the constructor look like that. Chord equals chord x, y. I, th I think they're trying to conserve kind of namespace. Um, and you're just meant to understand that this namespace is different from this namespace. Uh, I sometimes do it, and sometimes I don't. Sometimes I try and keep those separate. Since Professor Breitner keeps them separate, I'm going to keep them separate in this case. All right, so this is going to be the same in any of these cases. Oh no, the spacing is wrong. I have to fix it right now. Um, so now we have essentially picked apart the coordinate that was passed into this function. The C, the 
constructor is thrown away essentially and we get the we can now use these bindings of x and y in the body of our function all right so if we are going up we're going to create a new coordinate we create a coordinate just the same way we use the data constructor and give it some arguments so if we're going up the x coordinate is the same and the y coordinate goes up by one do I need a parentheses? I think I do need, because y is an integer, so it understands arithmetic, but the coordinate does not. And that's an example where the left associativity of expressions, but the right associativity of functions kind of can get you confused about what that plus was applying to. So Haskell thought the plus was applying to the coordinate, not the integer. All right, down is going to be the same thing, but with a minus. Actually, no, I've got this exactly backwards because in code world, we are operating from origin. So if we're going down, then y is getting negative. No, I was right the first time. Left is going to be like so, c, x minus one and y and right is going to be x is increasing. All right, so now we have a function that we will be able to use, except I have a lowercase c. Now we have a function that we will be able to use, hopefully, to move our avatar around the Sokoban map. We're also going to need starting state for our world here. So we'll call that initial chord, and that's just going to be a coordinate type. And big surprise, we're going to start at the origin. So now the last thing we need to do to get ready for homework two is to start understanding the interaction model, which means understanding a little more about code world. And this is part is very specific to code world and is going to involve some more complex function signatures than you've seen up to this point. This is a good point to duplicate this code. I'm going to use save as, and we're going to call it homework two, because this is going to be our starting point when we get to our lab. So what we need to do here is we're going to move away from, we get rid of, I'm in homework two now, right? Yes. Let's get rid of all of our exercise one and two stuff that we no longer need. I think we no longer need it. Uh, and our main function is now going to change. So previously it was calling, I'm going to move this all the way up here just so I have it. Previously it was calling drawing of picture of maze. In fact, we can do that, all right? Now it's going to be calling this function called, instead of a drawing, we want to be able to move things around. So we're going to be calling interaction of and we need to look at the signature for that. So I'm going to click on the guide here. We're going to look at entry points, drawing of, animation of, we already used when we drew our tree, activity of. Oh, I think they have renamed um, interaction of to activity of. So if you're using the Haskell for Sokoban version of this, I'm sure it's been updated. If you're using the CIS 194 version from fall of 2016, wherever you see interaction of, you want to change it to activity of. Let me do it myself. It's going to be activity of world. I find these more readable when they're function signatures I find more readable when they're on one line, right? To IO. Okay. So we've got four arguments. What's this world thing? World is the initial state of the activity. So what happens if we do our favorite thing? We said we take four arguments. No, we take three. Activity of what if we do this? Undefined, undefined, undefined. I think that's going to work out fine. I think that's totally going to run, don't you? Oh, it didn't work. Okay, why not? Well, first thing we need to worry about is what is this world? World is going to be our state 
for this activity. And this is a polymorphic function, or a polymorphic argument, excuse me, a polymorphic parameter. So it could be whatever we want it to be. So for right now, let's just define that as a coordinate, and that's going to be where the player is. And we already have a coordinate defined. We'll use, do I call it initial state? No, I think I called it initial coordinate, right? Initial chord, yeah. Okay, so now that's one argument, and it's not complaining about it, amazingly. <laughs> okay, I guess those aren't really comments, is what I'm being told there. So next we have something that goes from an event and a world to another world. Well, world to world is going to be coordinate to coordinate. So whatever this is, is a function that's going to take an event and a coordinate, and it's going to return a coordinate. Well, let's look and see if there's something in Code World that uses a code signature like that. The event handling function. Okay. Events. An event can be all sorts of things, key events, Mouse movements. Okay, well, I don't see a built-in function that goes from event to chord to chord, or event from something to something. So let's define our own. And let me save while we're here. Okay, so what does this need to be? This needs to be some sort of, it says the event handling function. Right, okay, well, let's call it the event handler. And it's going from an event and a coordinate to another coordinate, right? I think that's correct. So take an event, let's make it do nothing right now. Let's say it takes an event and a coordinate, and whatever that event is, it throws it away, and it returns the same coordinate. In fact, we can even do that, All right? So now we have this. Let's see if that fits in this hole. Well, I've got no warning there, so it seems like it does. The visualization function, which converts the state into a picture to display. So, Let's call it draw world. We actually already had draw picture, right? Oh, we'll, we'll make a new one for this. And that needs to go from a coordinate to a picture. And so uh, for right now, let's just, Can that be picture of maze? Yeah, for right now, let's just have it draw the picture of the maze no matter what the coordinate is. And in fact, we can wildcard that to show that we're throwing it away. And this needs to be draw world. Let's see what happens. I'm gonna make this bigger. Okay, nothing seems to be going on but it is drawing something. So that tells me that this might be working. I'm going to now refer to the lesson and figure out how Professor Breitner did this and see how it's different from my guess based on the types. Okay, well, he defined another helper here that is essentially at some X and Y coordinate, draw whatever picture you were given. And then he's using that to draw the maze at some coordinate. So let's go ahead and copy that. Right? And then his event handler, he's actually just grabbing the adjacent chord, 
the adjacent coordinate, uh, the next one up. So let's go ahead and do that as well. Right? And let's see what happens if we run it. Okay. And I don't know if you saw what happened there. Let me, can I, can I like pause it? I thought there was a way to uh, step through this one at a time. Well, anyway, as you run it, you see the maze is there and then the maze marches off up screen. So that tells us that there are all sorts of events happening here that are in fact being handled. They're just being handled poorly. So what we need to do is somehow filter these events so that we only care about the events we care about, which are largely going to be keyboard events. So if you'll recall, when we went to the documentation, we saw that there are all sorts of events here that have constructors. And the one we probably care about the most is key press, right? Well, how about, how about we handle this event here? Oh, let me stop that. Let's handle this event here and let's say it's key press, right? For right now, because we're not actually starting um, key press with a capital P. We're not actually starting homework two yet. We're getting ready for it. So let's say we've got an event handler, which if it's a key, if the if any key is pressed, we're gonna draw the maze uh, at. Well, we're going to adjust the coordinate system, essentially. And if it's any other event, we're going to return the same world state. All right, so the key thing to remember here is that what this event does is it mutates the state of the world. And at this moment, the only thing that is the state of the world is this coordinate. That's what we're remembering is some coordinate. And that may change, spoiler, probably will change during homework too. So let's try this again now, now that we've done that. All right, it is not moving. I think if I hit a key, let me, I'm gonna use a clicky key. Many people have complained about my keyboard and many people have complimented my keyboard sounds. The thing that you don't realize is that I have two keyboard sounds to pick from. The one you normally hear is when I press a letter. And you'll note when I press that letter, the maze moved up by one. But there is there are special keys on my keyboard. I'm one of those people who has a number pad, and I gave the number pad clickier keys. So whatever you type now, so if we type a key press, we're using this event handler, and every other event is simply using the keep the world state the same event handler. All right, with that, we may have missed one or two helper functions, but I think that this code is a good starting point for homework number two. Actually, I think there's one more very small change that I would like to make, which is, uh, I was just choosing pictures. I think I wanted to see the floor through the boxes or something. And I made the boxes triangles. But I think we're going to want, because I'm lazy, I'm going to want the player to be a triangle. So I'm just going to change these back to boxes right now. And we'll just make them blue rectangles for right now. And we may change that next week. And we'll clearly need a player picture type as well. Okay, good. All right, this went very long. I thought this would be a fairly short episode, but there was a lot of prep work to do. So in our next episode, we will, it will be a lab episode and we will tackle homework number two. 
without the safety of a net. Those of you who have been joining us and coming along for the ride, I hope you're finding this series useful. This is Haskell for Dilettantes. You're watching Programming Like It's 1979 here on Tea Leaves Programming. Thanks for watching.